for singing. Please be seated. All right, let's take our Bibles here this morning and let's go to Jeremiah in the Old Testament, chapter number 9. Jeremiah, chapter number 9. Johann Sebastian Bach was a German composer from the first half of the 1700s. He is, of course, considered one of the greatest composers of Western music of all time. He's up there in the echelon of the Beethovens and the Mozarts. Some of you that are into that kind of stuff know who I'm talking about, I'm sure. Bach once made this statement, though. He said, all music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. Where this is not remembered, there is no real music, but only a devilish hubbub was his words. He headed all of his compositions up with the letters JJ. The initials were for Jesus Juva, which means Jesus help me. He ended them with STG, the initials for Sole de Gratia which means to God alone be the glory. You know, we live in a world today that promotes and highlights this idea of the exaltation, the glorification, and the gratification of self. In other words, really, if you could sum it all up, man's chief end to life is to promote himself, to reward himself, to lift up himself, so that others can see who he or she is. It's all about me. I think it was 2016, the word of the year was selfie. Selfie. But what a description of the average mentality today. Paul wrote, I should say, to Timothy that in the last days perilous times shall come and men shall be lovers of their own selves, right? And we, we see that very readily promoted today. Uh, promoted and taught and, and, and as if that's the way it should be. That it's your happiness is the most important thing in the world. And really what it is is making self or ourselves an idol. That others worship through their adoration of words and mimicking of their lifestyle. Today God has a better plan though of existence that doesn't emphasize the glory of oneself, but instead the glorying of one who made this self, him, him. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Today I want to just talk to you about, I want to talk about glorying in the Lord, what that means. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time of study that focuses our attention in the right direction. Lord, when we are so full of ourself, we are so miserable. But Lord, when we lift you up and exalt you for the person that you are, our life is full of joy, of purpose, of peace. And Lord, I pray today that we would put our attention on you. And that's really what it's all about today. It's all about you. Help me to lift you up. Help me to glorify you more than anything else that all would see the greatness of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, what gets us excited about life? What gets you and I excited in life? Now, most likely, the things, I guess, that we're passionate about. You know, if we're passionate about something, that gets us excited, right? There was a Dutch diamond collector who was seeking for a very rare diamond. And there was a dealer in New York by the name of Mr. Winston heard of this inquiry and contacted him, letting him know that he believed he possessed the diamond this man was looking for. The diamond collector arrived and Mr. Winston had his salesman present the diamond. The salesman described all the technical aspects of the diamond. However, within minutes, the diamond collector rose his hand and said that was, that was not what he was looking for. Watching from a distance, Mr. Winston hurriedly intercepted him as he was walking out and he asked him if he could present the diamond again. The collector agreed. 
Mr. Winston pulled out the same diamond and started describing his admiration for this particular diamond. Within minutes, they were signing papers and he purchased the diamond. As the, giant, uh, as the gentleman was walking out, he asked, what just happened? <laughs> Why was it so easy for me to say no to your salesman a little while ago while, you, uh, while with you I purchased the diamond? Mr. Winston answered, that salesman is the best in the business. He knows more about diamonds than anyone, including myself, and I pay him a large salary for his knowledge and expertise, but I would gladly pay him twice as much as I, if I could put into him something I have which he lacks. You see, he knows diamonds, but I love them. I love them. He had a passion for them. What people love the most, they'll make the passion of their lives. Everything else will play second fiddle as we might say, to that passion. A person will invest their time, will invest their treasure, will invest their talent into the pursuit of that passion, won't they? They, they, they are, as we would say, passionate about whatever that is. Even to the point at times of personal sacrifices being made that others maybe would even consider a bit crazy. Like, wow, they're passionate about that. It will be the talk of their lips more often than not as it's what they glory in the most, if you will. The question for us is this. Is this passion really worth the investment, sacrifice, and energy I give it? As a teenager, I had a real passion for sports. I was real passionate about it. I, when I was younger, I, I, I loved baseball. I, every time the Twins played, I was either watching them or listening to them. I was a big fan, especially in 87 and 91. You know, the glory years. Those are long gone, <laughs> from what I understand. But those are fun years. But I, I was passionate about baseball. I love baseball. But as I got older, that kind of changed. And my passion became basketball. It was, it was, I played football. I, played, I, I ran track. I did that kind of stuff. But really, my, my number one passion was basketball. I lived it and breathed it. You know, I, I was in the gym a lot. I spent hours upon hours upon hours. I, I, I went to basketball camps. I played, I, I don't know how many games I played. Pick up games to organize games to tournaments to this and that and all that. I mean, I was very passionate about that. I gave myself to that. I'd watched triple headers on Sunday afternoons of basketball games. I watched college games. I, I tried to study it. So I understood how to play it. I wanted to become the best player I could be. And I found myself extremely discouraged at times when I wasn't what I wished I would be in that regards. Because there were certainly people that were much better than I was. But I gave so much of my early life to it. And even had the experience of winning a state championship here in Minnesota. But I can testify today, it never filled my soul. And I experienced a lot of personal insecurity because my identity was dependent upon how people viewed me as an athlete. Because that was my passion. That was my identity. I went on and I walked onto a college basketball team up in Moorhead and, and I got on that team. I was forced to redshirt because uh, the NCAA would not accept my ACT score because I took it through the National Guard. And that was a whole drama but forced me to sit out my freshman year. But it was during that year that God brought a teammate into my life who began to witness to me and talk to me about the things of God, which I was thinking a lot about because of my exposure to the military. And after that, I got saved. And I, uh, after my second year, if you will, playing, the team I was playing on was much different than the high school team I played on. We were, we were a good team in high school, but my college team was not very good. Terrible losing record. They had a lot of good players, but they could not play as a team very well, unfortunately. Or they struggled, at least. After my sophomore year, I had, I had played that one year. I was 15th on the bench. I played very little. I had more falls than points in my stats. And I was thinking to myself, you know what, I, I, if I'm going to play, I, I need to really work out this summer and so forth. But then I got saved in April, and, I, and they were going through a, a coaching change at the college there, and they were going to have a different head coach. 
And I was, I was thinking about what should I do? What should I do about this? Should I keep playing? And I had some people who said, yeah, you should keep trying to play. You're on the team, you know, uh, keep working at it. But then I was thinking to myself, I'm going to have to put in a lot of hours if I'm ever going to play. And it, came, and it boiled down to a question I had to ask myself, why am I doing this? And God spoke to me through a proverb that helped me make the decision of what to do. Proverbs 25, 27. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. And that spoke to me because the reason why I was doing it was for me. So I retired. <laughs> there was no big ceremony. They didn't retire my number. <laughs> Most people don't even have a clue I played it. <laughs> but I, I, re, I was like, I'm going to be done, at least with this aspect. I played some intramural stuff and all that kind of thing. But, but you know what? It, it, it revealed to me, you know, why was I doing this? Why was I investing all this time and energy? It was for me. It was for me. And I began to realize, you know what? Life is not all about me. I think we all have a little bit of struggle with that, I'm sure, to varying degrees. But but it begs to the question sometimes with some of the things we get ourselves involved in. Why are you doing it? Why am I doing it? You can even do that with ministry-related stuff. Why am I doing this? Now, I'm not here to say you cannot enjoy life and not have hobbies. And, and of course, we need jobs and have relationships, things like that. But there is one thing that needs to be really the, the first and foremost passion of our heart. And that is him. That is him. That is him. He ought to be the source of which, or the place out of which the rest of our life flows. You know, I grew up where church was just, you just got it over with on Sunday morning, and the pastor or the minister at that time just should be happy that I'm sitting in a chair. I didn't want that kind of deadhead religion. I wanted something that was real. I wanted something where it was just like, you know what, uh, what's the greatest thing to live for? Because I, I, from personal experience, I knew that self was, not, was a dead end. And getting stuff for me is a dead end. I wanted something different. And that's what I found in him when I got saved. You know, that was the passion of David's heart. In Psalm 27.4, I preached a message out of this not too long ago. One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after, that I will dwell, may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. And acquire in his temple. You know, David made God his passion. David's passion was God. That's why God calls him a man after his own heart, because he was passionate about that. And as a result of that, David became the king by which all other kings were judged. He set the bar because he had a heart for God. And there were some kings after him that did as well. But he set the bar because he was a man after God's own heart. God was his passion. And you know what's funny? When God's our passion, everything else just falls right into place. The relationships, the jobs, everything. Today, what's your passion? What, 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 what's like, what, what's the thing that drives you the most? Is it your job? Is it your hobby? Is it your pet? Is it your, your portfolio? Is it your hobby? Your, your sports? Your money? What drives you? What, 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 what's the passion in your heart? Hopefully today it's the Lord. Because with him as your passion, everything else in life will make sense. He's the central cog of everything. Without him there, there's, there's a piece, a major piece missing. And that's why it is emphasized in our passage here today. Our text communicates that truth very vividly. So let's consider it as we contemplate what we give our hearts to first and foremost in life. As we see first off what I call the idolized folly. The idolized folly. 
Now, the human race really gives a lot of applause, a lot of recognition, a lot of reward to people who possess the things mentioned in verse 23, don't they? Verse 23 right, er, reads this way, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. Now a lot of these things mentioned here, the world really says, oh, look at that person right up there. You know, let's give them a reward. Let's write their name in some history book or in, in some palace somewhere where people can come and worship it. In <laughs> so many words. The human race really applauds these things. People who possess these types of things. We see first off the mention of a the wise men is speaking here in context of the intellect. In other words, these people have achieved great uh, levels of education. They may have PhDs. They may have master's degrees. They may have multiple PhDs. There are some people today that have multiple PhDs. Very intelligent. They have IQs that are extremely high. I mean... I, I've met some smart people. I feel really dumb around them. <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow, you, you can figure out things pretty quick. You can articulate so clearly. You can, you can figure out some of these complicated problems, uh, uh, mathematically speaking. I mean, the people that put the people on the moon weren't dummies. They were smart. They were, they were, they were super intelligent. And people who have created some of the, the machines and some of the buildings. You know, we're, we were looking at uh, watching this thing about the Eiffel Tower here the other day. And this metal structure is almost 1,000 feet tall. And, and back in the 1800s when it was built, I mean, they didn't have computers and all that kind of stuff. They were using paper. But yet how they figured out to put that structure that's been standing as long as it had, almost what probably close to 130, 40 years. It's amazing the brain power that some people have. I've listened to some speak, and, and, and it, just, it just is incredible. There are very intelligent people who exist. Their minds absorb, hold, and disperse incredible amounts of knowledge. And, and we look at those people and we're like, wow, wow, they're smart. <laughs> it goes on and mentions the mighty man. In his might. And I believe what it's referring to here is strength. Strength. People with tremendous power and speed and agility and, and talent, or maybe just their size. You know, I've watched, I've seen a number of professional athletes, and sometimes it's just mesmerizing what they can do, how high they can jump, how fast that they can run, you know, how long they can run. And how fast they can run doing that. Or the skills that they have, you know, the precision. I have a relative that, I mean, I swear he's good at every one of these odd sports. Golf, tw tiddlywinks, um, <laughs> uh, darts, pool. I mean, he's just got that precise eye that he can, he can, he can do it. And he does it very well. I mean, it, it, I think I've only beat him in one sport. <laughs> And that's barely by, not by much. But I mean, just people have the, the, this, these, these abilities. I, I think these Olympic athletes that can do amazing things with their body. They can bend and lift and twist and flip. And the coordination levels and the skill level is just unmatched by most people. The mighty man. They got power. They've got just physical abilities that are incredible to behold. And it mentions the rich man, of course, the wealth. People who hold large amounts of money and assets beyond what the, well, let's just put it this way, the common person holds. You know, back a few uh, hundred or, t or so years ago, millionaires were kind of the, the top echelon. Well, today it's billionaires as well. And we've got, there's a number of billionaires in the world and a number of, of course, millionaires have grown exceedingly in, in recent decades. And these are people who have shown the ability to, to incre an incredible prowess to attain wealth. They have, 
uh, what some might call the Midas touch. Everything turns to gold that they do. And we look at all this stuff, and we, we as people naturally kind of get a little mesmerized by that, and like, wow, that's incredible. But yet God tells us in our passage, don't get too enamored with that kind of stuff. Don't, don't glory in that stuff. If you have any of that stuff, don't, don't, don't let that go to your head. Yet people do, don't they? Many of these people are sought after, widely acclaimed, yea, even worshipped by us mere mortals, as some of them may think. The world may celebrate them, but yet God says don't do that. You say, why not? I mean, they, they, have all, they have some answers. I want to kind of go in their direction in life, and many do. Many do chase uh, uh, dreams because they're like, well, this is the person I want to be like. I guarantee you there's kids today that have people on their, on their bedroom walls, and that's who they want to be like. And that's who they're pursuing. Why? Because they've obtained one of these three areas of life, and that's what they want. That's what I wanted. I had people on my wall. I want to be like him. <laughs> You know, the old saying back in the, back in the 90s, it was, I want to be, I want to be like Mike, like Mike. I want to be like Mike. It was the old Gatorade commercial. Some of you remember that. And there's still people who want to be like Mike. There's professional athletes today that want to be like Mike. You say, who's Mike? Michael Jordan, okay? <laughs> Just some of you. Who? <laughs> some of you young people. But, but I'm just saying. Why, 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 why not pursue that? Well, because in a moment's notice, all that supposed glory can be removed in an instant. Can be removed in an instant. And it has happened. Back in the book of Daniel, Jerusalem and Jer Judah had been conquered and taken captive by what was known as the Babylonian Empire at the time. Basically encompassed what we know today as the modern Middle East. Iraq, Jordan, uh, Parts of Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, that kind of area. And the ruler of that kingdom was by a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was ruthless. He conquered everywhere and he just spread like, his kingdom spread like wildfire. But it was of the Lord because the Lord was using him to judge the, the idolatry of the region. And do some other things as well. But in Daniel 4, we don't have time to read the whole, whole situation, but Nebuchadnezzar gets a dream about a big tree that goes up, reaches up to the heavens, but then all of a sudden it's cut down. It's cut down for, for a time. And Daniel, the faithful prophet there who, by God's grace, is there in the palace, is that brought in to interpret the dream, and it's discovered that that tree was a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. He had grown huge. But he was thinking that it was by his own abilities that did this. And the Bible makes it clear, it was God that allowed it. But Nebuchadnezzar's pride was getting, was getting pretty bad. And Daniel, when he heard the dream, sat for an hour, astonished. Like, oh, boy, how am I going to tell this to the king? Because the picture of that tree being cut down was Nebuchadnezzar being cut down and humbled severely. And Daniel explained to him that this is what's going to happen, king, if you don't humble yourself before the almighty God, you're going to be driven wild. You're, you're, you're going to lose your mind. You're going to be out in the, with the beasts of the field eating grass like an ox for seven years until you realize that the Most High ruleth in the affairs of men and giveth the kingdom to whomever he will. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had about a year to think about it. And about a year later, he's walking around the palace, and says, this is not this great Babylon I built for my glory and my kingdom. You know, and as the words were coming out of his mouth, there was a voice from heaven that said, Nebuchadnezzar, the, uh, you've had your chance. And God took his sanity from him. And here for seven years, he acted like a wild animal, crazy. And, and what we call secular history records this even too. That he had lost his mind. He lost his power, lost his wealth, and lost his everything until he finally, at the end of seven years, humbled himself and recognized who the God is. Daniel 4 is the testimony of this man getting saved, I believe. 
I believe Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven today, despite the skunk he was, but he humbled himself before God and got right with God. But, he, but, but, but it happened to him, despite his great power and glory. And he's not the only one that's happened to. You know, there, there are people today that have amassed millions, yet even billions of dollars and have lost it all. Lost it all. There are people who've hit the pinnacle of their athletic careers only to go down in shame. I'm thinking of a certain golfer that that happened to a bit. And there, there was, I know basketball players that never reached their potential. There are even people in whatever genre of uh, sport or, or, or business or even politically. I, I'm thinking of a, a former vice president candidate that went down in flames. Because he, because of some issues he got himself in, you know, the, it does say the, uh, that the uh, how the mighty have fallen, and they, there are many that have fallen. It can be lost in a moment's notice. See, we have to remember that if we have anything in life, it's because God has enabled it. The Bible mentions about Him enabling wealth, Him giving strength, Him giving wisdom. Guess what? All the things that we have ever received or gotten or are born with, they were all God-given and we have nothing to glory in. We have nothing to glory in. We have nothing to say, look at me. Let me tell you something. The only reason you got that or I got whatever it is is because God gave that to us. God enabled that within your life. Is all God given? He can give and He can take it away as He wills. That's a sobering thing to remember. He can take whatever we have away. Job understood that. Job had everything and Job lost everything in a day. And we have to remember that God is the one who's the giver. Man's glory is fleeting at best and not something that should be the passion of our hearts or else we'll find our lives very unstable and insecure when the perceived glory isn't given to us. You know, there are a number of people that have been teen idols over the years. And they grow up, and they're very popular, and everybody want, fawned over them and so forth. But over the course of time, they got out of that spotlight, and they start behaving in very unusual ways. There's probably some names you could think of right off the top of your head. <laughs> I'm thinking of a couple of gals that were teen idols, if you will, but after, after their, their, their time in that spotlight, they clamor for it back and they will do the most outrageous things just to get it back. I mean, just the most outlandish things. Why? Because they need that for their own personal stability. When we are pursuing our own glory, if we do not perceive it, it will create great instability and insecurity within the heart and you'll do anything it takes to get it very sad situation we can find ourselves in and it's not just those types of people it can be us too we can have the same kind of attitude so we see this idolized folly you know you may have some wisdom you may have some might you may have some ability there's nothing wrong with that but that's not what we glory in that's not who we are as people because you know what? We can lose those things at a moment's notice. And we can't get certain things. You know, there's some people today, I'll, I'll, they have more talent than I was ever born with. You ever watch somebody like that? It doesn't make you sick. You're like, you've been working so hard and they can just go out and do this thing that you want to do so bad. You know, you had no control over that any more than I did. You can't put your glory in that. You can't. It's an idolized folly. But secondly, we see the instructed focus. Verse 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercised loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. You know, God here wants to instruct us on what we should glory in instead. That we understand and know him. And that we glory in him who he is above all else. And the scripture just repeats that over and over. I'll, I'll share 
about six verses with you here quickly. Isaiah, or Psalm 44, verse 8. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. Amen. In God we boast. Isaiah 45, 25. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. They were going to glory in him. 1 Corinthians 1, 31. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. 2 Corinthians 10, 17. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Galatians 6, 14. Paul writes, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Verse after verse, and there are more verses that I could bring out, but the, I think that you get the understanding. God doesn't want us glorying in those things that we may have or what somebody else might have and desiring those things as much as we desire to glory in him. In other words, celebrate him. Be enthralled with him. Say, why should I be enthralled with God? Because he's the dominant one. He is the dominant one. He is the enabler. He's the one that's great and good and powerful and strong. And he's our fortress. He is our strength. He is the lifter up of my head. He is everything that we need. He is the great I am. That's why. Because he is the greatest one. We are to be mesmerized by him. We get mesmerized by what people have and can do and what they have achieved, but it pales in comparison to what God has, what God has done, and what God can do. Sometimes we as people name drop, you know, we, maybe we know somebody or have met somebody personally, and, and, and we, we do that sometimes. And, and I'm not saying it's not neat to tell somebody that, you know, you've met somebody. When we were on deputation, I was, uh, we were out in a, out east and we were with a church and we were sitting down to eat with the pastor and his wife and we got talking and, and the pastor's wife said, well, I, I've got a, I got a nephew that plays in the NBA. I was like, really? You do? Wow, that's, that's something. You, you, maybe you've heard of him, you know, and you say, okay, what's his name? Dominique Wilkins. Some of you are like, who's Dominique Wilkins? <laughs> the human highlight film was his, he, he was a, he was an incredible player. For the Atlanta Hawks for years. He, he, he's, uh, I think, one of the top 50 all time. Top 75 now or something like that. But she was like, you're related to him? Yeah, he's my, he's my nephew. I'm like, wow, can I get an autograph? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, that, was, that was, it was pretty neat. You know, this past week, uh, I had an opportunity to meet a, a, a sitting U.S. senator from a different state that was up here. Uh, and uh, I had met him once before when he was in the house, but he was up here, and I got an invitation to be able to, to meet with him. I got a picture with him and all that, and, you know, it's kind of fun to meet some of those types of people. I've met a lot of different people over the years. But for some people, it's, it's like who they know that they feel gives them a real higher social status or edge in life. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm friends with so-and-so, you know. It's like, you know, it's, it, it, it's almost like, wow, look at me type thing. God says, if you know and understand me, God, you have the highest edge in life because you can't get any higher than him. A lot of times, I think the reason why we don't see that so big is because we don't see God so big. God looks is pretty little in our life. But if we can see him for who he is, it's like, wow, there is no greater being than him. There is no greater being than him. If you know and understand me, you have the best edge in life. You know, we live in a world, of course, that is trying to push God out of everything, but yet he's the greatest being that there is. And that's really what I want to lift up today, more than anything else, is God, who he is. How well do you know this God? See, I don't, maybe you don't know him very well. That's why you need to be in his book, because he will reveal more of himself to you. And you'll be like David, be able to sing praises to his name without a problem. When you and I see God for the person that he is, he's quite, he's quite unique. Because there is nothing that can compare to his character, which is flawless. Nothing can compare to his power, which is limitless. There's nothing that can compare to his holiness, because he's perfect. He is the essence of perfection. And no human being can even begin to come close to how great he is. 
Do you celebrate God at all? I mean, is he, do you ever just sit there and fawn over God for a while? There are people today, you'll, they'll fawn over Taylor Swift. They'll fawn over uh, Elon Musk. They'll fawn over a political figure. They'll fawn over this person. Oh, they're the great, oh, you know. When was the last time you did that about God? When was the last time you did that about God? And just sat there and just dwelled upon who he is and thought about him. And it's just like, wow, you are something great, God. You'll do that if you've been in the book. You've been spending time with him. Because he'll make that known to you. That he is the king. He is the great one. He is the dominant one. He is the loving kindness. Uh, he has loving kindness. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is all the things the Bible describes and more. When was the last time you fawned over that and just like got lost in the reality of who he is? Again, we'll do that with some of these celebrities, but what about God, who's the greatest of them all? Who's the greatest being that there is? You know, it, it says here in this passage, he exercises loving kindness. And you think about how loving kind God is to a human race that deserves judgment for the way they treat him. This, this human race really does deserve judgment. They, this human race treats God so poorly, so poorly, but yet God in his loving kindness shows such grace and such mercy on a continual basis to us. He could have thrown us all in hell long ago. Instead, he gives out grace and time for us to come to him and be right with him. You know, he exercises justice indiscriminately and fairly in, in this world. And he will ultimately do that. He is not a respecter of persons. He treats every one of his children equally. Now, it doesn't mean we go through the same types of things because God is working differently in each life, but he loves each, uh, each of uh, his children the same. He exercises righteousness, for all his laws are right and produce right results when they're obeyed. No other being can claim to do what God does. The reason this world doesn't exalt him, and certainly he does put the world's puny idols to shame, the reason the world doesn't exalt him is because so many in our world don't know him. Nor do they understand him. In a lot of cases, they don't even care to. They don't care to or, or don't want to or don't pursue him. In often cases, they're too busy pursuing those other idols. But if you and I know God, we have everything we need in him. When I speak of knowing God, too, I'm not just talking about knowing factual knowledge about him either. And no doubt, people here today, we could all list out different attributes of God that we, we know academically, if I can put it that way. We could say, yeah, he's, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent. He's, a, he's, a, he's omniscient, he's, he's love, God is love. We, we know some of those, I'll call them statistics. You know, we can read a biography about people, right? And we can get to know who they are by what was written about them. But there's a big difference uh, about in regards to knowing about somebody versus actually knowing them personally, right? There are lots of people that you and I know about, but we've never met, right? There, there's lots of people we, we, don't, we don't know personally. What I'm talking about, what, what the Bible's talking about knowing God, it's talking about knowing him personally. Not about him, but knowing him as we know, would know a person. And how do we know him personally? Well, we have to come into a personal relationship with him. And that has to have an actual start date. It's a day when a person is saved. It's a day a person is saved. Salvation happens simply when a person comes to the end of themselves, when they realize that they have committed wrongs and acts of sin against God and that they have judgment pending on them as a result of that. But they realize then that Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross, provided a blood atonement so that that sin that they have, they have committed could be taken care of, wiped out clean, and made right with God. But there has to be a transaction time where that takes place where the, the, the atonement of Christ gets applied to our personal sin account. When a person is saved or born again, 
That's the day that it happens. And they have to be willing to agree to God on his terms on how that takes place. First off, there must be an attitude of repentance. In other words, we must acknowledge that we've done wrong and have a genuine sorrow that we uh, have wronged God and we want to live right as a result of that. We want to live for him. That we actually want to go in a new direction in life. And that's missing in a lot of professions where they say, oh yeah, I made Jesus my Savior, blah, blah, and they just never really repented. They never really did go in a new direction. They just maybe added a little religion to their life and they kept going in their direction. No, repentance is a change of heart that results in a change of direction. There's that repentance aspect. Then there's, a secondly, the faith aspect where we trust Christ alone with our sin, or to pay for our sins, and not ourselves anymore. For me, I, I, I've mentioned many times, I trusted that I was a quote-unquote good person, or thought I was. Some would debate that, probably. But I was trusting that my good was probably out better than my bad. But the problem is, we've done more bad than we actually have done good, if you look at the scriptures. And no, by the way, it would be impossible to be able to, to work our way to heaven that way. When a person is willing to accept those terms, the Bible says there's just one thing left to do, and that's to ask him for it. I remember the night I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me, and I saw myself as that lost sinner, hell-bound, hell-deserving because my sin's against him. And I was willing to go, uh, I was willing to admit what I was before God, I was willing to go in a new direction in life, and I was willing to place my faith alone in Christ. And that night, I called upon the Lord back on April 4th, 1999, and that day he saved me and forgave me for everything I'd ever done and I was made right with him you know when a person gets saved there will be a specific time there will be a specific place and there will be understanding of what needs to happen there will be a before and there will be an after and that's when your relationship with God starts when our sin has been taken out of the way by that salvation experience. Otherwise, you can't communicate with God. Sin separates you and Him. But now, with that blood atonement upon your sin account and mine, we have direct access, and that relationship with God will begin to build. And afterwards, in salvation, that's what you're pursuing. It's a deeper, more affectionate relationship with Him. What was our memory verse this week? 2 Peter 3.18? But grow in grace and uh, knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, God wants you and I to have a deeper, fuller appreciation for Him in a personal relationship with Him to the point where that's what you glory in above all else. That becomes the passion of your heart. Today, do you know God? Have you been saved? If not, that's your first step. And if you have been saved, then let God become the passion of your life because he'll make all others we make appear very foolish because they're not worthy of, of him. As we see thirdly and finally and quickly, the inspired fascination. Verse 24, it ends off here, it says, for in these things, what he had previously spoken, I delight, saith the Lord. This is what God delights in, righteousness, loving kindness, judgment, and so, so forth. And we see that God concludes that this is his delight which is meant to inspire us that these would become our delight as well, that we would become the avid worshipers of him, to become enthralled with him that becomes our everything in life, that he's the most important. And I believe that those who have pursued this kind of relationship with God have the most joy, have the clearest purpose in their life, and make the most out of this life. Why? Because they will find what God wants them to do. They'll do it with all their heart and they'll have God backing it every step of the way. They impact the lives of others like none others can do. And that, of course, ultimately impacts eternity forever. Their lives really count for something. I don't know about you, but I want my life to count for something. I want, it to, I want it to count for something. I, when I die, I want, it to, I want it to have made some sort of difference. 
what greater difference can somebody do than that that lasts forever? That's connected with God who made everything. Tonight, do we glory in the Lord? What do we glory in? Do we glory in ourselves, the heroes of this world, or do we glory in him first and foremost? What's the passion of our heart? You know, as we see it from our text, God should be the one we glory in the most, that we would pursue him with all of our heart, just like David mentioned there in the Psalms. And out of that passion, the rest of life will fall into place the way it's supposed to. May we glory in the Lord. Let's take a few moments here this morning and we'll stand to our feet for a time of invitation with every head bowed and every eye closed for the sake of people's privacy. If today, what has God spoken to your heart about? The pianist is going to play here and if you'd like to spend some time there at your chair or if you want to come down to this altar and pray. But glorying in the Lord see the passion of our hearts today? Do we want to lift him up with all of our being? Do we want to love him? Or, or is there other things that have stolen our hearts? Idols that we've made? That, that make it a passion? That, that, that steal our passion? It ought to be him. He's got to be the first and foremost. And out of that relationship, all the other ones will fall into place the way they're supposed to. Today, I want to just lift him up. But maybe the first step you need today is that you need to get saved. You don't have a relationship with God. You don't know him. You know about him, but you don't know him. If that's your need here today, Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. There's somebody down here front that'd be glad to take you aside and show you from God's word how to be saved by the way. How to get that relationship going. And he'd like to help you with that today. Would you like to, to know for sure? Would you like to have that relationship settled with God? God wants you to have that. But the choice is yours. There are people praying. We'll give them time to deal with the Lord here. But that's your desire today. Would you come? Talk to God. Keep playing here. A few more, a few more notes here. Let people deal with business with God. What do you glory in the most? What's the exaltation of your heart and mind? May we put him first and foremost. When those things are in proper place, he becomes the everything of our lives. I hope today that's your desire in your heart. Father in heaven, today we thank you for your word and thank you for the instruction you give us and the direction we are to go as your people. Lord, I pray for those who have been saved and know you and I do pray that you would become the center focus of our lives. I thank you, Father, for your love and grace. I thank you for the goodness you've showed towards us. Lord, help us to glory in you more than anything else. Let us not, be, let us not take for granted, Lord God, these things. For these things that we have can be lost so quickly. But Lord, that what we have in you will last forever. Help us to put our attention first and foremost there. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for being here today. And just some things to consider. I, I, my, my desire today is to lift him up more than anything else. I think we need to see him in a greater way because he is the one that makes life make sense. 
and he gives you direction, he gives you peace, he gives you the grace, he gives you everything that you need. Without him, we have nothing. And we need to keep him as the number one focus of our life. Jesus did say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? Number one, let us glory in him and everything else will go appropriately. Well, just a few quick announcements before we depart here. Um, we have, a, of course, Missions Month coming up. We got some different things going on with that. Uh, we do have Tuesday the, the prayer call at 7 o'clock and also the GAP Standards uh, prayer chain. I guess there's no sign-up sheets. You usually have to remind of that, but uh, nothing in that regards. Tonight I'll be continuing on our Back to Basics series, and we're going to be talking about how we are to be witnesses. You say witnesses. What, what do you mean by that? Every person who's ever been saved needs to be a person who tells another person how to be saved. That is our responsibility from Scripture. And there's different ways in which you can do that. But God clearly shows us from his word how important that is. It's a basic of the Christian life. And I want to encourage you to be back here tonight and, and let God speak to your heart and inspire you to be a witness for him for his glory's sake. Amen. Why don't you come, Trent? You can do a verse and then close with prayer if you could. Thank you. Please open your hymnals to 150-150. My faith has found a resting place. We'll sing the first verse of this song, 150. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall bleed. I need no other argument, I need no other. died and that he died for me let's pray heavenly father i thank you for this day lord i thank you for uh, putting this message on pastor's heart lord i pray that you would help us to be attentive to to our relationship with you lord i pray that we wouldn't be distracted by the things of the world, Lord, but that we would be most passionate about our relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that if this idea of being passionate about God is foreign to us, Lord, that we take this opportunity to, to reflect on our state of salvation and if, if need be, to repent and turn to you. 